Thank you. Welcome back to this National Academies webinar. And thank you very much to Rita, to AZA, Kristen, Daniel, and Huda for their very thoughtful perspectives and the very vibrant discussion in the first half. Um, it's really a, a tough act to follow, um, but a great start to this webinar series. I am Katya Bros. I'm a program officer at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and one of the co-chairs of the Action Collaborative that helped plan this webinar series. And in the second half of this webinar, we're going to be hearing from a panel of inspired neuroscience leaders about their perspectives on these issues. So these broad issues of how we re-envision training, how we think, rethink measures of success, how we promote more inclusion and diversity in the field, and generally how we evolve the culture of science. I wanted to first uh, very briefly introduce the panel. Detailed bios can be found on the meeting website. Uh, Corey Bardman is the head of neuroscience at CZI, so my uh, boss and colleague, and she is also a professor of neuroscience at the Rockefeller University in New York. Walter Koroshetz is the director of the National Institutes of Neurological Disorders and Stroke at the NIH. Kelsey Martin is a professor of biological chemistry and psychiatry and behavioral sciences at UCLA, where she's also the dean of the David Geffen School of Medicine. And Mark Tessie-Levine is the president of Stanford University. Thank you again all for being here. Um, let me start very briefly on a personal note. I have known each of these panelists for a very long time. Mark was my graduate advisor, full disclosure. Corey was on my thesis committee and uh, is now, again, my colleague at CZI. And Kelsey and Walter I've known for many years from my time at Neuron. And I can say that I have personally learned a lot from each of them um, about science, vision, and leadership. And um, for trainees, I just wanted to say, kind of echoing the points made in the earlier panel and maybe as an inspiration, that we don't know where careers will land. And I think each of these um, folks are really inspiring examples of how careers can take many paths. And I'm sure none of them would have guessed um, at the start of their careers that they'd land where they are now. So let's start with the, um, the first question. Um, it is an understatement to say that this has been a challenging and very unusual year. Um, so with a view towards uh, the needs of trainees specifically, how do you think as institutions and leaders representing very different constituencies, academia, the NIH, philanthropy, how do you view the current period of uncertainty and what has it taught you or us about general challenges in our systems and culture and where there may be opportunities for change? I think I will start with Mark. Great. Well, uh... Thank you, Katya, and I, I want to start by thanking you and, and your colleagues for organizing um, this really outstanding series and, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, excellent panel today. Um, I, it's a real uh, honor to, to be part of this panel and to be able to um, address the issues that are confronting trainees right now. This has been a very difficult time, uh, first and foremost COVID, of course, but also uh, uh, many other aspects of, of uh, the past year have been uh, challenging, stressful, troubling, uh, the um, uh, brutal killings and, uh, uh, and heartbreaking acts of injustice uh, around the country that have, have triggered a call for uh, uh, us to address racial justice with, with urgency. Um, the events uh, in government in Washington uh, over the past year, but culminating in, in the events of two weeks ago uh, in Washington. Uh, so there, there's much that's been uh, difficult for everybody. I think we have to uh, that's sort of a, a framing comment for all that we're, we're looking at right now. Uh, in terms of uh, trainees, uh, of course, uh, uh, the move of um, education online brings a lot of stress. Lab closures for everybody who is uh, lab-based, which uh, probably many of the trainees on the call are lab-based, whether they're graduate students or, or um, postdoctoral fellows. Um, uh, impacts on careers uh, as, um, uh, first of all, people's work is interrupted and slowed down. Uh, and uh, secondly, the job market, uh, of course, has become much more challenging uh, right now. As, uh, most universities, our university was one of them, uh, that put a freeze on new hiring, uh, something that, of course, we would like to relax as soon as possible. But uh, I, I think the, the first thing I, I want to convey is that uh, everybody in a leadership position in a university currently is well aware of the, the stresses on, on trainees. Again, graduate students, uh, postdoctoral fellows, and others, undergraduates uh, uh, as well. Uh, secondly, uh, as we, we, we look at these, um, uh, uh, the, our, our first um, uh, impulse, of course, is to see how we can help. Um, 
uh, uh, providing uh, help in the form of technological assistance for those who are challenged in terms of online and remote learning, uh, providing financial assistance for those uh, in need, um, uh, and trying to, to help uh, those with, with special circumstances. Uh, one of the things about COVID, of course, is it's, it's affected everybody, but some people have uh, been hurt much more. The, the inequities of the system have been um, uh, revealed in many ways. Uh, we look at, at students whose uh, uh, living arrangements at home uh, are really not conducive to, to online uh, learning. How do we help with that? Uh, people with uh, children and families, uh, many uh, uh, women are particularly uh, impacted. Um, so uh, a lot of the university's resources have gone first to helping everybody and secondly to try to address the special circumstances of those in need. Beyond your question, Katya, was what can we learn about, about the future? I think one of the things that um, uh, this had, has done for us is uh, just uh, put into focus the difficulty of the academic path. It's already difficult in good times, let alone uh, in bad times. Uh, what can we do uh, to facilitate uh, you know, a, a, a more streamlined, uh, supportive, and straightforward learning experience uh, for our, our trainees is one of the questions that, that's top of mind, again, highlighted by the, the challenges uh, of the moment. The other thing is um, the, uh, we already know how challenging it is for postdoctoral fellows who uh, are interested in an academic career, um, how long that can take. And of course, that's going to be lengthened right now. So what other systems can we put in place to support them uh, during that search, uh, and especially in light of the pandemic? I think the, the, the pandemic has highlighted and magnified some of the, the, the problems in the system already and forcing us to confront those. Yeah, Kelsey, I wonder if you could add to that maybe a perspective also of being a, a dean of a medical school, really seeing that intersection between uh, basic research and the medical school environment. Yeah, happy to. And I also want to thank you, Katya, and all the organizers and say how much I loved listening to the last panel. I felt incredibly energized by that. And, you know, I would say that you know, I'd echo on Mark's comments that what COVID-19 and what the pandemic has done is it's really um, revealed in, in stark lighting all a lot of inequities that have existed. And certainly we've seen that in terms of uh, populations that are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, both in terms of clinically, but also in terms of how they respond, you know, how they've been impacted by the economic consequences of the um, uh, of the pandemic and how they've been impacted by the, the, the need to have massive changes in how we do business, working at home, um, having to have access to uh, technology. And so, you know, from the, from the medical school perspective, so I, I see as a dean that this is, creates a huge opportunity. It's like a, a seismic shift or an evolutionary leap where we now see where there are a lot of things that were always difficult for many individuals, but we now have the opportunity to collectively address them straight on and, and, um, and explicitly. Uh, I see that, well, I, I you know, recognize how difficult um, this the the pathway to academic neurosciences and to careers in neurosciences. I also feel like that what I've seen from the pandemic, the fact that the vaccine is available and the vaccine is available because of you know nearly 20 years of work on RNA vaccines, over 50 years of works on coronavirus. And I think about the kinds of similar pandemics that exist in terms of behavioral health. Um, I think that there's a there's going to be sort of a, a societal reckoning of the importance of basic science research to uh, health, to clinical care, um, and certainly for us, as we as we've had to address the pandemic, there's been so much collaboration between basic scientists and clinicians, and a real demonstration of the of the interdependence between those um, what can often be somewhat disparate uh, cultures, let's say. Um, and then I just want to add that the other aspect that uh, of, of the COVID-19 pandemic is it really created this, um, this again, stark lighting that um, where the, the, the killing of George Floyd and, and other acts of police violence, really, it could not be ignored. I mean, there, it really highlighted a structural racism that our country has lived with for centuries. And I think it's forced a reckoning in academic institutions around that. And there have been some really practical things that, you know, the last conversation made me think about in terms of how do we select 
uh, candidates? How do we select faculty? How do we select medical students? Well, a good example is that because of the pandemic, you couldn't have um, the MCAT testing centers were closed. And so that forced something that's been on the plate for a long time. How do we evaluate candidates for medical school if we don't have those MCATs, which are known to um, discriminate against individuals with from underprivileged backgrounds? And you know, so I think that it's just been this opportunity for us to address so many problems that have been there. And I actually consider it not to be overly optimistic, but an incredibly exciting time for anybody who's looking at a career in, in science and in medicine. It's, it's just shown the power of science and medicine. And Walter, um, can you give us a bit of a view from the NIH, how you all are thinking about this period of change? Well, I think a lot of common themes that, that uh, Mark and Kelsey put in front of you. Um, <clears throat> I think in terms of what we see, it's, it's almost like there's been a pause and everything was, on, was frozen for a period of time. Now things are thawing out. So for trainees, it means they lost time. And um, I think most of the institutes are very interested in trying to help people who are caught in this transitioning period. So extending fellowships, training programs, and paying for those extensions are the kind of things that we've done. And that's, you know, with, with all the loss due to COVID, that has risen to the top, I think, across NIH. Um, so we are incredibly um, tuned in and, and glad to hear from the people who are in training uh, at the sessions today. Um, I'd like to say, you know, uh, kind of there are certain ways to take advantage of a crisis. And I think Kelsey uh, made these pretty clear. So, you know, at NIH, there's been lots of talk over the years about how to improve the diversity of our workforce. but now it's kind of come to the point where, well, if you don't do it now, when are you going to do it, given what's happened? So the wheels are really moving. And so I think that there could be some real significant changes at the NIH side that are you know, within our legal abilities to do to improve diversity workforce, to really stamp out harassment, which actually was a big program before, uh, uh, before the concentration on racism. But, but now you know, that morphed together, um, at least here at the Institute and hopefully in our grantees, where we can pull the levers to kind of obliterate that kind of bad behavior, which is really destructive to trainees. Uh, I think um, we have done surveys of trainees and the, you know why they went one direction versus the other direction. The thing that comes up more and more often is that it was really influenced by their mentor. So if there was a a female trainee who became pregnant during her postdoc and the PI got all upset that they're gonna lose you know, somebody at the bench, that's a really bad thing to happen to someone and, and can push somebody out of science. And on the other side, there are great examples where you know, a, a woman was considering moving out when she became pregnant and the PI said, don't you dare, you do not do that. You cannot you know, make that move. It's, you have to stick with it and, and that's, that's again been uh, once again, over and over again, the mentors are the key. Now, maybe in COVID, hopefully there might be a change. You know, the mentors oftentimes were in the air. They were visiting professors of the American Airlines um, and uh, now they can't do that. So they're, they have to actually interact on a daily basis to keep the lab going in, in this COVID time. So maybe there's a silver lining there too. Um, the remote technologies, the, their power, I think, is something that we learned about. And particularly with regard to trainees, I think to build science communities is so much easier now. And, uh, and then, you know, the kind of things that popped up, uh, like Aaron Gittler's uh, NeuroZoom at Stanford, you know, people all over the world get on those things and talk about this science. Um, and it doesn't cost you an airplane ticket. Um, so... Hopefully there are some things there that, that trainees can take advantage of um, that will also um, continue into the future. Um, and then I, I think as Kelsey said, um, we can talk about neuroscience, hopefully we get a chance about later, but the point is that we are in a pandemic and science brings a solution. 
So I think that this raises the um, profile of science in our country at this time. You know, it should have been there all the time. There's lots of discoveries that you know, save lives, but um, uh, hopefully you only get one chance to snuff out a pandemic. And I, I think that we're on the path to do that. Um, and so I think science gets a higher profile, which I think bodes well for trainees now who are, they're really, they're really inheriting the science of the future. And, uh, and they will make the science of the future. If they don't like it the way there is, you're going to have a chance to change it. Um, us old guys, we want to listen. We want to change it too. Um, but eventually we're dead. And as you know, Steve Hyman used to say, science progresses one death at a time. <laughs> And, and you will then inherit this, this, uh, this great community of scientists and have a chance to make it better. And I know you can, and, and so we're, we're all, we'd like to have, help to have it, make it happen faster. So thank you. Great. And Corey, I think maybe bringing in your perspective as somebody who's straddling um, academia and philanthropy on, you know, what are, what are the kind of positive learnings from this period? Kind of, uh, Walter mentioned sort of science being more front of stage in our larger society, but how, how do you see sort of the, the, the future of learnings from this difficult period? Yeah, I, so I don't, I absolutely agree with the other panelists that this has been an extremely challenging time, particularly for postdocs. Um, but I want to say that we've also seen how people will step up in this situation and do things that we didn't expect. So, for example, here is this pandemic. It's an absolute emergency. And many people pivoted from what they were doing and started working on the pandemic. People who were skilled at molecular biology, started to figure out how to do PCR reactions on sewage to figure out how the virus was traveling around. People were... People who were working in physics were actually building were, 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 were building PPE actually in New York in the spring because it wasn't available commercially. And so people were figuring out how to use the shops. That's a trivial example. But we saw many people who were able to use their expertise and move into a new problem. And it just shows you that ordinarily we're not flexible enough about letting people move into new areas. But that when people see an opportunity to use their strengths, to work with other people, to make a bigger impact, they really step up to that. And I think we're, we can do more in our communities to make it possible for people to be flexible, for not making it that someone has to follow one career path for 40 years in order to feel like they're contributing. I did enjoy very much some of the earlier panels and like Kristen's discussion of how she moved back and forth. And of course, Mark is an example of someone who's moved through different career paths as well. But even if, on the shorter term, moving to a new project, bringing your new ideas, working with other people who are experts in their areas to do something better than what any of you could have done on your own, I think has been a lesson. Another big lesson, which again, um, I think comes out of tragedy is that we, we have seen leadership from the students, the postdocs, the young people in this racial crisis throughout our country. The leadership has come from below. And I will say that at the Rockefeller University, my institution, it has been the students and the postdocs who have thought about how to change things, how to open more doors, how to bring in more people. They've been creative, they've been consistent, they've been really, really forceful on the issues of how Black Lives Matter. And I think that that, again, is something where it's a, it's a lesson to those of us who, who know that this was a problem, but just weren't acting, that the younger people are stepping up and making that happen. So I think broadening who we include in these conversations from the beginning is something that we can learn from and do more of going forward. Yeah, I think sort of pivoting from those kind of um, big lessons from the pandemic and, and how, do, how do we distill this into how we think about how we train and mentor careers? And so from a perspective of training specifically, or I, I would say training broadly, so not um, literally undergraduates, graduates, and postdocs, but how we, how we mentor people through their careers. From a leadership perspective, where do you see the greatest challenge and the need for change in how we train and support the next generation of scientists? And maybe I will, um, I will start with, with, or go back to you, Mark, uh, on this one. Oh, you're on, you're on mute, Mark. There we go. Sorry about that. This most famous saying of 2020, 
uh, or most uh, common saying. The, um, the uh, in, in terms of, uh, 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 as I look at, at uh, current neuroscience training, um, it, uh, obviously the, you know, first and foremost, as you're training to be a neuroscientist, you have to learn the craft of science and that requires uh, a deep focus in, in a particular uh, area. And we can talk about that, that more. Um, uh, as I look at uh, the opportunities um, for, uh, uh, for our trainees, uh, and perhaps uh, partly because of my own experience, I went to the private sector to, to biotech for eight years after being a professor and then before coming back as a, a university uh, president. And I saw the extraordinary opportunities in, in the private sector. I worked in, in biotech at a company called Genentech, the opportunity to to apply science to develop therapies for poorly treated diseases was really just an extraordinary opportunity, incredibly exciting, incredibly fulfilling. That's something I knew nothing about when I was a, a trainee myself. Um, and, uh, and I look at my own trainees um, uh, over the years, uh, uh, about half of them uh, have taken academic positions um, uh, and half of them have gone off into other fields, um, often not knowing very much uh, about them. Katya, you're an example, went straight from graduate school into scientific publishing. Um, what, what's, uh, uh, so we do have to talk about the craft of science and what, uh, how to train students to be the best neuroscientists they can be. But, but I also think that it's an important part of the training that we do not do a very good job on generally is to provide our, our trainees with the tools to think about what they could do with their their PhD um, and, and their scientific training. There's so many wonderful things you can do. Um, uh, many people who start doing a PhD want to um, continue in academia. Uh, we know the statistics. We know that by the time they graduate, um, uh, 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 many more of them have opened their minds to other opportunities to see how they can use their, their uh, training in other fields, whether it's in teaching um, or in biotech or the pharmaceutical industry, in uh, disease foundations and scientific publishing and patent law um, in government, wouldn't it be great, um, especially uh, um, uh, if we think about uh, uh, recent events to have more scientists uh, in Congress. Um, so there are so many um, uh, wonderful opportunities with a PhD and, and our students don't um, often get the uh, exposure they need to be able to think about those as possible career paths. So supplementing their uh, training, uh, student training, with exposure to other fields so that people can understand uh, uh, all the wonderful opportunities that are available to someone with a PhD so they can choose. Providing optionality to our, our trainees, I think, is very, very important. I'm, you know, the academic path is a wonderful path. Uh, it was my path for many years before I left and then came back. Um, and also just um, uh, helping our trainees understand that um, uh, life is lived in chapters. Uh, and that you may, uh, as I did when I started my lab, right next door to Corey Bargman, we started uh, two months apart, as I recall, at UCSF. Uh, I thought this was going to be my career for the rest of my life. But little did I know that, you know, a decade and a half uh, later, I would be doing something else because my mind had been open to the extraordinary opportunities that were there. Um, life, there's so many great options. It's really important for people to know about them. It's important for people to um, uh, have the opportunity to follow their interests uh, wherever that will take them. So I think that's an important supplement to our training uh, that I'd like to see more of. Corey, I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about um, some of the some of the discussions and work that we're doing at CZI to really think about new models for science and who is a scientist who contributes to the scientific endeavor. Thank you. I'd love to talk about that. So one of the things about the academic system is that universities have a pretty clear division of the teachers, the professors, and the students. And that doesn't map in 100% accuracy onto the whole scientific process. So yes, there are people who are students who are learning, but I'm not sure it's any more, more to the point to call a postdoc a trainee than it is to call me a trainee. I wake up every morning knowing that I should know something that I don't know and trying to learn that. And learning is a, a continuous experience. And yet we sort of pigeonhole people into this sort of temporary people, people who are moving on, particular labs with particular structures, a large size of a lab with one lab head. And I think that, that it's time for us to rethink that a little bit. And one of the things that I've been thinking about at this philanthropy is how we can sort of rethink the culture of science a little bit to recognize that not everyone needs to be part of this, you know, of this very 
rigid potential hierarchy. I don't think it's a surprise, I don't think it's a coincidence that some of the groups that have been doing very impactful work in public health and disease research during the COVID era are institutions that have a little bit of an identity outside of being strict ac academic institutions. So these are examples like the Broad Institute in Cambridge or the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub in the San Francisco Bay Area. These are places where people can be technical leaders instead of leaders of a research area, that they develop incredible te technical expertise, and then they can move around on different projects with that expertise. And in fact, many institutions have people like that in universities too, and we don't give them enough credit and we don't give them enough recognition. So um, within many institutions, you'll find that the person who knows most about microscopy is not the head of a lab or the head of any lab, but really the head of the microscopy facility, who will be keeping up with the field, who will know how to teach, who will know how to innovate, who will know how to collaborate. And these people don't quite fit into our hierarchies, and so they don't quite get the respect and recognition that they deserve. And one of the things that we've done and the philanthropy is to specifically set up grant programs to recognize those scientists, to link them together, to have them develop communities of practice, to sort of increase their visibility and their prestige within the scientific community. Other parts of science, again, that are technical and that make all of us much more effective are things like, the, at this point, the technology tools, the software, the bioinformatics, the, the different kinds of computational science that are moving science forward. Now, um, you know, five, 10 years ago, it was really common for an experimentalist to do some work and then just sort of try to throw it over the fence at a bioinformaticist to try and solve it. But increasingly, again, these are collaborators. These are people who will move between different projects and they might not all have to be called professor to be incredible contributors to the scientific enterprise. We've been supporting software fellows. We're supporting people working in open source software. And again, many institutions have people like this, but they're not quite sure how to think about them. And I think just kind of like bringing this out, recognizing the importance, having this kind of, and this allows everyone to be more dynamic, more innovative, more forward-looking in their research. And, I, and just opening that door, maybe recognizing again that science is not just part of a university system and a training system. Science is at this point really important to our society and will only be more so. And so opening up the universities to make them a little bit more flexible and in this and to bring in experts and not just have trainees and professors, I think is something that we could we could be doing more of. That's great. I, mean, I think this relates also to uh, in some conversations that I think Kelsey, you and I had around kind of redefining also um, what, what the field is, what the field of neuroscience is and bringing in uh, other, other realms of expertise, um, COVID and the pandemic, uh, the racial unrest, I mean, have certainly kind of oriented us towards the place of science and society, but what about the influence of society on science? And so really bringing in more social science um, perspective. And I'm curious how that's playing out for you, especially being at a medical school. I mean, you mentioned earlier thinking about um, health disparities around um, sort of behavioral sciences. Yeah, well, I would say that that I mean, I do think it's really important to take a step back and say, what is neuroscience? I know that frequently when I have conversations, especially with clinicians in, in neuroscience departments, and I, and I talk about neuroscience, they think I'm talking about neurobiology. And it's much broader than that, right? It, it is really, what do we learn from psychiatrists and neurosurgeons and neurologists who are clinicians? And what do we learn from social scientists who are really interested in, in human behavior? Enormous amount to learn. If you look in psychiatry, some of the you know, major contributors to psychiatric disease really um, have roots in, in um in sort of socioeconomic um, uh, uh, environment, in, um, in traumatic experiences. Um, they're probably linked to biological, but you know, where can we make interventions? And I think um, it, get, it gets back a little bit to me to what Mark said about really, as a trainee, one needs to learn the craft. You have to become really expert in, in a discipline, in a way of thinking about neuroscience. You know, for me, it was really cell biology and molecular biology. And that's because that's what I love. But I really recognize that to understand 
the brain and behavior, one needs really all these different disciplines. And it, it is that flexibility that Corey was talking about, about recognizing that you as an individual learn this discipline. And I think what we need in training is how to not just teach that discipline, but teach how one then works with others <laughs> to answer a big question by putting together and respecting all those different ways of solving problems. And part of that very practically is expanding the definition of who is a mentor. I mean, I was fascinated, mm -hmm. Walter, when you said that when you did an analysis of, of um, career paths of awardees, that the, the mentor was sort of the major point. And I think that's so important because if we have mentors who have a very closed minded view of what is neuroscience, we'll never get to that point of really being able to take all those disciplines and how do we knit together the molecular with the circuit with the social and really in the clinical and understand uh, brain and behavior. Yeah, Walter, I, I wonder if you have anything to add to that also, I think on some of the, the points that were made earlier around um, really um, expanding the scope of the uh, of, of who is a scientist, who's contributing. I think you're doing a lot of work at NIH around team science, especially with the BRAIN initiative. You're on mute, Walter. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it's a little different at NIH. We're a government agency and taxpayer invests in us to solve problems. And our problem at our institute is to understand how the nervous system works, which we know so little about. And then to use that knowledge to reduce the burden of disorders of the nervous system. And, you know, if you feel bad, I, I used to tell my residents when they complained about life, you know, just go up on the hospital ward and see what people who have diseases are suffering. Um, so so the, the good news about what we're doing is that it's, you know, it's inherently valuable. We didn't make it up. It's a problem here to solve. We need a lot of people to solve it. My definition of a neuroscience is anybody who helps me solve my problems. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so it's very broad. And, and, but I think, you know, not to be facetious about it, what we've learned is that the problems that neuroscience has now come up against, um, the previous way people trained is totally inadequate to help them solve those problems. So just the one example, you mentioned the brain initiative. You know, the problem <clears throat> five years ago was if you wanted to understand how the brain worked, you had to stick an electrode in one or two neurons at a time, show the monkey something, collect the data, and try and figure out how the whole circuit worked based on those, you know, very limited samples. Now the problem is we have the technology and we can record from a million neurons simultaneously, but good luck trying to figure out what any of that means. And so the people who study the one single neuron at a time, they can't help. Who can help? It's gonna be people who have this ability to look at really multifaceted data in a highly computational manner. That's, that's just one example. Um, I, what is, what has troubled me over the years is that when we first did our um, strategic plan for basic science, the message from the community was, leave us alone, give us the money, don't do anything, we're fine. That was wrong. Um, the Brain Initiative taught us that, one, you're not fine if you don't have the right tools, and two, if you don't have the right people coming in, you're not fine either. And so looking to the future, the advantage we have is that neuroscience is actually inherently interesting. So it's easy to pull people in to neuroscience and it is diabetes, I would gather. But we have to reach out and get the people who can solve our problems for us and build the tools that bring us to the next level. Now, in terms of this dichotomy between you know, the individual labs and the team science, um, that is a really um, you know, high priority question for us. And, but it's now clear that there are some things you're never gonna get the answer to unless you have team science. So the brain initiative, you wanna get a cell census of the entire human brain, that's gonna take hundreds of people working on it and no individual lab is gonna be able to do it, but we can do it if we get the team together and that benefits from that will accrue to everyone in, in their individual labs. And when you say, when people say team science, I guess one thing to throw out is that 
on the clinical side, is pretty much nothing but team science. You cannot solve a clinical problem by an individual. So people learned that in the 80s and 90s, where it used to be one person was in charge of everything in a different science area. That's not the case anymore. Um, so every clinical trial is probably 300, 400 people working on it. Most of the clinical research projects, again, probably 20 or 30 people. They're expensive because of that, but but those are there are precedents for team science and neuroscience, certainly on the clinical side. And now with the brain initiative, certainly on the basic side too. So thinking, thinking about these different ways of evolving training, I'm wondering whether we could sort of divert briefly to talk a little bit more about kind of measures and um, assessments and rewards and incentives. I mean, that was a big topic in the first panel all four of you think about a lot. And really, I think as someone in the first panel said, I mean, we, we can't reach our values if we don't uh, reward them. And so I wonder uh, if we can talk about that briefly, how that's playing out in, in different um, parameters. And so uh, Corey, maybe we'll start with uh, philanthropy and CZI, knowing that uh, Philanthropy is not, not all of CZI is um, oriented to all of philanthropy. And so we do things our way, but I wonder what you can say about what philanthropy can do to shift rewards and incentives. So I think if you think about what the rewards are in science, the first thing is like, what is rewarding to me as a scientist? What reward, what does each person do as their rewards? And I think, you know, scientists are really motivated by discovery and by impact. And that's what we see in COVID. That's why people were moving. They wanted to make an impact. They wanted to make discoveries. Second, they're motivated by respect. They want to be part of the community and um, be treated with respect by their colleagues, no matter what their age. And third, they're motivated by autonomy, by some ability to make their own decisions, to follow their own instincts in their work and not sort of feel completely, not feel completely shut up in, in you know, one particular thing that they must do. And the tools that we have to kind of help move these things around, I think the, thing, the tools that we have to kind of move these personal incentives around are jobs and funding. So we can use those tools to try to create different kinds of environments in which people can be successful and can meet those needs. And I would say with, you know, as we look at some of these projects that might involve someone working on a project for a short time, contributing, as we've mentioned, a computational expertise to an experimental project or medical expertise or some other area, the, the, the sort of classic mechanism of recognizing people, which is, um, the, which is the exact amount of papers they've published as first or senior author, there have to be other ways of, of opening that up. So there have to be ways of recognizing what people are contributing to groups. There have to be ways of recognizing contributions that are not just in the form of a paper, but in the form of resources that other people use. You should get as much credit when somebody else uses your mouse as when you use your mouse. Making these things broadly available are things that we can recognize. Making your science available, whether it's as a preprint, whether it's as data sets that people can share, whether it's software or tools that people can use, those are all what we consider at the philanthropy evidence of productivity. And productivity and reach and impact are not just measured in the published paper, which after all was a technology invented by Isaac Newton. There are other ways of communicating our science in the modern era. There are other ways of recognizing them. We can as funders and we can as employers recognize those other forms of uh, productivity. We just need to do the work. We need to bring ourselves in to document these, to have ways of recognizing, for example, that a particular um, piece of data infrastructure is incredibly widely used and recognize and celebrate the person who generates that just as much as the person who uses it to make a particular advance. This, the genome project has been a great example of this in the past. We've learned to work together and give people recognition in that. And there are other groups as well. You know, physicists are not particularly known for being warm and cuddly, but if you look at the collaborative projects, for example, at CERN, they have worked out how you give people credit for the work you do, how in large group projects you can give individual credit for a group that will get people tenure at Princeton or whatever that happens to be. And so we just need to be open to that as employers, as funders, to help move our field to where we want our field to be. 
Great. Walter, do you see um, as the NIH being kind of a major source of both rewards and incentives, do you see um, a, a shift in the wins at NIH for how people are evaluated um, in terms of productivity and career progression? Well, that is a hard thing to change because uh, we're a granting agency. So by law, what we do is we review grants and we give out the money. Our, the levers that we have are to develop new grant mechanisms. So the R01 grant you know, can be used to form a team to go over after a problem. Um, but we have new grant mechanisms that we use to try to you know, balance things out better. So there's a new one coming out, which is only for people who have never had an R01. And the stipulation is that you can't put any preliminary data in the application, and it has to be an area that you weren't working in before. And so it's a pretty radical idea, but the, but the, the driver is that people think that we're so confined that you have to do what you did before to get a grant. And this gives young people an opportunity to try to do something brand new that they haven't ever done before. Um, and so there's also these pioneer awards and new investigator awards, We're all trying to kind of go against how the system is regulated. Now, I think what I've seen in terms of team science, and then again, this is more on the clinical side, is that groups form and they self-form. And they, because of the group and the capabilities of the group, they have incredible power to get money from NIH to solve problems. And the really ones that are sustainable over time are incredibly sensitive to always sharing the credit. So for instance, the one I was involved in was the Huntington study group or the Parkinson study group in the beginning. And they basically are a mafia now. You can't get a study done except you go through them because they have everybody. Um, but each study has a different head of each study. And the person who was the head now was you know, second in command before. And, and so they, they really take care of the young uh, people coming in. And, um, and I don't see why that couldn't work in other fields. Um, that kind of, but it's gotta be, I mean, the problem with the government is, if you think our problems are bad, wait till you see our solutions. So you may not want us being the driver. Um, but I think if, I think, you know, with the kind of discussions that are going on in the community and the power the community has, you can, you know, if you're a powerful group, you come in and you get a grant, um, you just have to have the right people on the group. So we have done things like, for instance, we have Parkinson's centers without walls. So now you can't come in unless you have a project on it that is going to be run by an early career diverse um, scientist. Uh, brain initiative language is similarly going to come out very strongly in that fashion. Um, but those are kind of, I think, tweaks more so than what we really need is the community. I doubt that the National Science Foundation told the, the physicists what to do. I think they probably told the National Science Foundation what to do. <laughs> I mean, on a similar topic, Mark, can you say something about how um, you as president of Stanford are thinking about rewards and incentives in particular around um, hiring career decisions? Yeah, the um, well, one thing I, I should say is that the, the those decisions are actually made by the the, the faculty, uh, the departments, um, and uh, the deans, uh, and then it gets up to the provost. So uh, the the president's actually not involved uh, directly in these, but I can tell you uh, some of the issues and and how, how people are thinking. Uh, I think uh, uh, Corey and Walter both um, identified, you know, some of the. The, the strains on the, the existing system, the existing system being one of uh, looking at individual productivity measured by scholarly articles, right? Uh, that will continue for foreseeable future to be certainly the base, a, a, a foundation uh, of looking at people's uh, productivity, but uh, um, uh, modifying it to accommodate, for example, the, the team science that, that Corey and Walter both talked about. And again, the physicists have largely solved that 
and and the, the they provided tools for people in other disciplines and in biomedical science i think we've been slower to adopt this but it's been accelerating with as corey said the genome project and other the the, the brain uh, project um, uh, that we can measure, uh, we, we, we have ways of assessing the contributions of individuals to, to group efforts. Another area that I don't think has, has been mentioned so far is uh, people who fall between the cracks because of their interdisciplinary work. We all recognize the importance of interdisciplinary work, chemical biology, um, but the, the biologist might assess that the biology of the chemical biologist is not up to their standards and the chemists might think it's not the most cutting edge chemistry, yet we recognize that having individuals, uh, uniquely gifted individuals at that interface and pulling it together is a great gift to science and to society. Um, and we that's been solved also as, as people have uh, come to recognize, we, we've had a big push at, at Stanford for 20 years on trying to break down the silos between disciplines, creating interdisciplinary institute, interdisciplinary programs, and the ability to assess the interdisciplinary contributions uh, of individuals as well. It's an evolution rather than a, a step function. We recognize the problem, and but the culture of departments has to be, they have to be brought along. It's a slow process. I think one question is how could we accelerate it? Uh, another area is people who are, are starting and do scholarly work that's easily recognized, but then see a potential application to a disease and, and decide to to focus on that, which might not lead to a publication in the near term. It might lead to some inventions, some patent applications. And, and we have to have ways of, of encouraging and rewarding that as well. You know, Walt, as Walter said, the NIH uh, has the job of encouraging discovery to then apply to, to tackling disease. And we have to uh, reward people who are taking that extra step. So uh, what I see in, in academia is a gradual evolution as people in different fields uh, uh, see these issues coming along and gradually adapt to them. I don't, haven't seen yet sort of a, a systematic way of saying, of, of identifying a, a, a field and saying, um, okay, now let's change the way we do this here. So I'm optimistic about gradual evolution. I'm, um, uh, uh, um, uh, I feel a sense of urgency to help accelerate that, but uh, I don't see um, that happening um, uh, uh, on a rapid time scale. And maybe a, a related question, which I'll, I'll start with you on, Kelsey, which um, actually I'm now starting to take some questions from the Q&A, which relates to this topic, but also to a point made in the earlier panel around sort of the intersection between ground up grassroots e efforts and top down buy in. And I'll, I'll actually read the, the question because I think it mm -hmm. sort of um, places the challenge. Um, you know, what are the practical steps that can be taken to get top-down buy-in? I'm concerned that the current institutional leadership, having come up through the traditional system, will be hard to move. Uh, words are one thing, but action is another. And I think this gets at that point that um, the field is changing, the field will change. And I think to Corey's point about how um, so much inspiration and energy um, is really coming from the bottom up, but how to... to do you or we in leadership positions kind of meet that with a similar sense of kind of urgency, momentum and commitment? And I'm wondering um, if you could speak a little bit to that and, and maybe bringing up also the challenge that you as institutional leaders may have in really kind of um, meeting that, that challenge. Well, you know, I'm at a University of California, so a public university that's really has an incredibly strong um, concept of shared governance with the academic senate and decisions are made very much as a partnership between the faculty and um, the administration. Um, I, um, you know, my Cha the challenge I see is how do you get the entire community to try to think about the greater good um, for the field and the greater good of the organization. And it's not just faculty, it's the staff and the trainees in the organization. And I do think that we are at this, we have this opportunity. I, I agree with Mark that it's a slow evolution to change how we reward and, and um, how we make change at an institution. But I think that we're at a moment right now where there's so much pressure. And, and again, maybe the pause from COVID-19 and actually, you know, the, the economic consequences of the pandemic that have been very difficult, at least for medical schools, and I believe also for, you know, uh, universities um, by and large has kind of forced that that reckoning as, as well. Um, we are doing a lot of town halls. We've started uh, an anti-racism roadmap that is something that we're co-creating with 
with our community where we're looking at and at um, how do we redesign our, our medical school curriculum? How do we look at the experience of graduate students and postdocs in those individual laboratories? What is the data that we have on our staff and faculty recruitment and experience? How do we really need to rethink the composition of our search committees? And it's been very much a, a um, a co-creation experience where the, the challenge is how do you move forward? So how do you really have a roadmap that's moving and yet that's integrating voices? But I actually feel that through that process, by incorporating all those voices, we're actually able to um, you know, move forward in a way that is you, you, you measure twice and you cut once as opposed to you make a decision and then you go, oops, that didn't quite fit, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's just a new, a, a different way of, of um, making collective decisions than has been the norm in many, at least many academic institutions and certainly in medical schools. I'd say medical schools are extremely hierarchical. I wonder, Corey, whether you have comments. And so um, again, kind of straddling academic philanthropy, but um, Philanthropy isn't constrained by the same um, maybe uh, structures that academia has, and especially an organization like CZI that's relatively new and has in its mission statement the word accelerate. Um, do you have ideas for how we can, uh, you know, seize the momentum and the urgency? If we can make change around a world pandemic, shouldn't we be able to make rapid change around uh, systemic racism and other larger issues around how we um, accelerate the future of science? Yeah, I think one of the great lessons I learned from Bruce Alberts when I was a starting assistant professor at UCSF was that when you have new resources, you can try new things. Mm -hmm. Think about something like the National Institutes of Health or Stanford or UCLA, these great institutions, they should be moving slowly and deliberately. They're so successful that they need to maintain what they're really good at while they build out new things. And I think that there's, it's not either or, that these groups should continue to do that and groups that are starting up, whether they're new institutions, whether they're new philanthropies, have the opportunity. Or don't, we don't have to feel that we're already trapped in our own success. We can um, try things, we can fall on our face, we can try new things in ways that just wouldn't be responsible to do with the taxpayer's money or with the medical students at UCLA or however those things are working. So I think that the the, the willingness to try out new experiments, to say to people, hey, we're doing funding this way, or we're supporting an institute that's working using a different pattern, or a collaboration that includes a set of people who wouldn't have been part of the traditional academic path, like community organizers and patient groups, and not just scientists. We can do that, and if it's successful, then we hope that that will create examples for other institutions to build up. So we can, in a sense, de-risk that a little bit for them going forward while making those next steps, while opening the doors to those next steps. That's excellent. I, I want to um, start to close, but I want to close with um, a question uh, for brief answers for all of you. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to see the inauguration of a new president and a new administration. Um, very exciting that President Biden has reinforced his commitment to science and in his letter to Eric Lander, who will be the lead science advisor of the administration, a cabinet seat, he's framed five questions. And I encourage everyone who hasn't seen that letter to read the letter, it's a very good letter. One of which is how can we ensure the long-term health of science and technology in our nation? Huge question, not a short answer. And I'm asking for you for a short answer, but from the perspective of evolving and accelerating the evolution of how we train and support the next generation, can you very briefly just say what you would advise to um, President Biden and Dr. Lander, what should be um, the, the highest priority item for their agendas? Maybe I'll start, uh, it's probably totally unfair, but uh, Walter, you're, you're on the inside. <laughs> Yeah, they'll tell me what to do here. <laughs> <Let's be careful. laughs> uh, well, I think it's, you know, it's pretty, in my mind, you know, the future is, depends on the young people. And so I think we can't just assume that things are going to happen the way they did in the 70s. Um, and we have to listen to the young scientists now and, uh, and ensure that they see science as a fulfilling career. I think there's lots of ways of doing that, but I think that is the secret to the future. One thing I would throw out is that our, our scientific workforce is not really diverse. Um, and 
we are also incredibly heavily reliant on people coming in from other countries. Uh, we need to continue that, that pursuit of global science, but I don't think we do even near what we should be doing to uh, hook young people on science, particularly neuroscience. Um, and so I think moving younger um, and trying to get people to see what it's like uh, to have a fulfilling career in science is I think something we should kind of rev up more than we do now. How about you, Kelsey? Yeah, so um, I remember when I became the Dean, I, I thought about something that Joe Bi I heard from Joe Biden many years ago, which was don't tell me what you value, Sh show me your budget and I'll tell you what, what you value. So, but that, you know, that's a little bit, um, I mean, it's a bottom line view of it, but to me, it's it's articulate, you know, develop a society and an economy that articulates the long-term value of science uh, to our nation. Mark? I, I guess in terms of uh, 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 training and supporting next generation of scientists, I would say um, make science training accessible, inclusive, and exciting. Um, help young scientists understand the diversity of ways in which they can apply their scientific um, expertise to benefit society, and then support them as they launch their careers. Um, those would be three prongs. Excellent. And Corey? I would say um, it's not one size fits all. I think that's really important whenever making these kinds of decisions. And it's about the people. Science is gonna be as good as the scientists are to the extent that we have a vital, supported, um, critical, curious, interactive, and, and diverse scientific community, we will generate great science. And especially in neuroscience, there's so much interest in the next generation in this area that there's no reason we can't have that. Terrific. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to the to the panel, um, to Corey, Kelsey, Mark, and Walter for this excellent discussion, but also to AZA, Daniel, Kristen, Huda, and of course Rita from the earlier panel. I think it was uh, super stimulating. Always hard to do these things in Zoom, and I think we'd have so many more discussions happening out over, um, over coffee if we were at an actual meeting. Um, we really appreciate the thoughtful perspectives that you're bringing to these issues. I also wanted to thank the members of the Action Collaborative and the organizing committee, and especially uh, Sheena, Chantel, and Claire in particular, who really uh, made this possible. This has been an evolving project. It started from really um, something relatively small and contained to a full webinar series. And I think um, the responsiveness, especially of the National Academies and really kind of extending this out beyond what it was originally envisioned to be, I think was uh, great and shows um, tremendous kind of flexibility and adaptability that staff. Um, as noted by Rita in her introduction, this webinar series is really intended to spark a broader conversation. We are just scratching the surface and um, you know, there's, there's only so much that you can do in a webinar. And the intention really is to motivate change and action, both uh, in a groundswell from the bottom up, um, but also top down amongst leadership. And talking about these issues is incredibly important. It's a first step. Listening is incredibly important, but action is probably more important. So we definitely hope that you'll take these discussions back to your local community, your labs, your departments, organizations, and consider what concrete steps you all can take or can contribute to. Um, the, the academies has put together a, a Slack community to allow these conversations to continue on in virtual space throughout the webinar series. Uh, a number of the workshop panelists and action collaborative members will be online today to respond to questions, uh, but you're welcome to contribute to that um, in real time going forward as you wish. And we definitely hope that this space will be an ongoing community for dialogue, uh, community building as some of the early organizers mentioned and something that lives on beyond the webinar series. Um, finally, I wanted to mention the three other webinars that are coming up um, on January 25th, the webinar on fostering inclusion, equity and diversity in neuroscience training and this will be, I think, an important extension, um, but expansion as well of the webinar that happened in August that you can see recorded online on racial equity. In February on the 16th, there will be a webinar focused on postdoctoral training. I think as a number of the panelists mentioned, I think there's 
um, you know, heightened attention to especially uh, the plight of postdocs during this difficult time. And I hope that um, that will be an interesting discussion. And lastly, um, really, you've seen that this webinar series that started as something focused on training um, really is more broadly encompassing. It's really trying to re-envision a shift in the culture of science and the shift in the way that we train in neuroscience um, to meet not just the current crisis, but um, a changing world. So we hope to see you at those webinars going forward and on Slack and uh, someday in person. Thank you, everyone. And um, again, uh, we welcome feedback on Slack and I hope we can keep in touch.